Namaskar students, today we'll be starting with our uh, we will be starting with our lecture 23 and this will be we are on the other two schools of uh, neoliberalism as most of you know until now we have done two schools of uh, neoliberalism we'll be finishing off with the other last two schools of neoliberalism. That is the institutional and the republican schools of neoliberalism. Now, what are the pre uh, precedents of, your, of these two schools? See, it picks from early liberalism about the beneficial effects of international institutions, especially institutional liberalism. Woodrow Wilson, especially, of converting the world from a village of chaotic, chaotic power politics to a zoo or from a jungle or what we call the survival of the fittest or the policy of might is right to a reg and regulated peaceful intercourse. But present liberals agree on the limitations of this, but powerful states will not easily be completely restrained by any international institutions. International institutions are more than mere handmaidens of strong states. They, say. they are independent of independent importance and they can promote cooperation between states. What is an international institution? It is either an international organization such as the North Atlantic TT organization or the European Union, or it is a set of rules which govern state action in particular areas such as aviation or shipping. These sets of rules are also called regimes. We will be doing the regime theory later, but this is a very important uh, aspect. Other the uh, Often the two go together. Trade regime is shaped primarily by the World Trade Organization or WTO. There may also be regimes without formal organizations. The law of the sea conferences held under the auspices of the UN or the United Nations. Most of you know just on 24th October, the United Nations come, uh, completed 75 years of its existence. Uh, you also have institutions like the United Nations and regional organizations like ASEAN. Now, one of the persons, very important thinkers of this school is Stephen Krasner. Stephen David Krasner is an American political scientist and international relations scholar, academic and former diplomat. Krasner has been a professor of international relations at Stanford University since 1981 and served as a director of policy planning from 2005 to 2007 while on leave from Stanford. Regime theory is a theory within international relations derived from the liberal tradition that argues that international institutions or regimes affect the behavior of states or other international actors. It assumes that cooperation is possible in the anarchic system of states as regimes are by definition instances of international cooperation. Now what are regimes? As stated above, a regime is defined by Stephen Castor as a set of explicit or implicit principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures around which actor ex expectations converge in a given area of international relations. That means you come together voluntarily and decide to make certain rules through which you will abide. This definition is intentionally broad and covers human interaction, ranging from formal organizations like the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, to informal groups like major banks during debt crisis. N note that a regime need not be composed only by states. So it is not state-centric, 
members can also be non state actors and multinational corporations new liberals believe that realists neglect the degree to which countries share interests and the nature of state relations realists err by implicitly modeling the world using a classical single player prisoner's dilemma in which the payoff structure makes defection a dominant strategy for both players the difference between this model and reality is that states are not like prisoners states must continuously cooperate where prisoners will never see one another again once decisions today then have future consequences mutual cooperation is thus rational the sum of relatively small cooperative payoffs over time can be greater than the gain from a single attempt to exploit your opponent followed by an endless series of mutual defections the evolution of cooperation mac in his book mac robert axelrod referred a single shot exploitation as the behavior whereby states avoided tit for tat most we have done in game theory what we call uh, prisoners dilemma will do in in the it iterated prisoners dilemma the actors behavior is determined by the following assumptions states are rational unitary gain maximizing actors living in an anarchy and ridden by the security dilemma there are future consequences for present actions the prisoners dilemma is not a one shot even thus it is in the interest of states to cooperate in the present because in the future other states will defect on them thus at uh, the theory proposed he supposes that states are concerned with absolute gains that is states do not consider the gains or losses of other states in their utility analysis in contrast neo realists and argue that states are concerned with relative gains that is states are concerned with the advantages they gain versus the advantages of other states in the anarchic system the second major writer in this school is robert kiyoki he also talks of international regimes neo liberal international relations theorist robert kiyoki argues that international regimes can increase the likelihood of cooperation by providing information about the behavior of others by monitoring the behavior of members and reporting on compliance regimes clearly define what constitutes a defection and often clearly prescribe punishments for defection this reduces the fear that the state is being exploited by other members of the regime and minimizes the chances for misunderstanding prescribing sanctions reduces the incentive to covertly defect reducing transaction costs by institutionalizing cooperation regimes can reduce the cost of future agreements by reducing the cost of reaching an agreement regimes increase the likelihood of future cooperation for example each round of the gat that is general agreement on trades and tariffs resolved many procedural problems that did not have to be revisited in subsequent rounds making cooperation easier and more likely generating the expectation of cooperation among members he also says that it is very important that we generate an expectation that all of us would cooperate now development in the 1970s and 1980s the international organizations metamorphized metamorphized into the study of international regimes the core idea was that self centered states create international regimes to solve collective action problems institutional liberals claim that international organizations and international regimes help promote cooperation between states the extent of institutionalization can be measured on two dimensions scope and depth 
scope concerns the number of issue areas in which there are institutions. Now, depth of institutions have three main uh, characteristics. The first characteristic is commonality, meaning the degree to which expectations about appropriate behavior and understanding about to interpret action are shared by participants of, in the system. Second is specificity, the degree to which these expectations are clearly specified in the form of rules, autonomy, the extent to which the institution can alter its own rules rather than depending on outside agents to do so. Now, what is the success of the institute? Many people give us the example of the European Union. Institutions make up for the lack of trust between states, which consequently are much less in the developed world where states are doing and, and why. Institutions thus help reduce member states' fears of each other. For example, between France and Germany, they were the greatest enemies, two wars, world wars they fought. But now they are cooperating, they are one of their neighbors and they cooperate. They provide a forum, but unfortunately, most of you know in SARC, we have not been able to do India and Pakistan. And you have China above, which is the one that has used Pakistan against its enmity against India. They provide a forum for negotiation between states. That's why SARC, we say, is in an infantile paralysis. They foster cooperation between states for their mutual advantage. Institutions provide continuity and a sense of stability. They foster cooperation between states for their own mutual advantage. Institutions help create a climate in which expectations of stable peace develop. Now, what are the key concepts? Uh, in institutional uh, neoliberalism. It provides a flow of information and opportunities to negotiate. Meaning if you succeed in one area, like how the European Union began in 1952, then you can move to other areas. Two, it enhances the ability of governments to monitor others' compliance and to implement their own commitments. Hence, it gives you stability to make credibility to make credible commitments in the first place. Three, strengthens prevailing expectations about the solidity of international agreements. Now, what are the challenges? It's not that it is a totally a rosy picture. There have been problems because in many other areas that have not been able to yet conquer territoriality. See, in European Union, it, they have transcended territoriality, meaning they don't have any uh, wars or differences or conflicts based on territorial claims. That is not the case with Asia. In Asia, we are still in the face of territoriality. You have a power like China that keeps claiming everybody else's territory. So you have the growing need for the regulation and uh, that institutions provide. They are lacking in power and legitimacy necessary to take on heavy responsibility. International institutions are overtaxed in a double sense. Their basis of legitimacy is too small for the responsibilities they are supposed to carry out. But in view of the magnitude of global problems, what they do is not enough. Many of the post-war international institutions have been supplemented with or replaced by new institutions that intervene more deeply into the affairs of national society. Most of you know when the UN failed in humanitarian intervention, you had NATO take over some of it. Continuing with the challenges, these institutions increasingly exercise independent political authority and violate the principle of non-intervention leads to serious problems of legitimacy and public international institutions, for example, recently the WHO, the way they talked about COVID, what uh, the United States calls as a China virus, and US is the largest contributor to the World Health Organization. China doesn't even 
contribute one tenth of what America contributes. And still the WHO seems to be under the control of what China wants it to, to be said on the uh, China plague, as the Americans call it, or the China virus. Instant international institutions are too weak to regulate international financial markets of effectively combating climate change and its impact. See in America, the Green Deal has become a major issue of uh, the American, uh, what to say, presidential elections. Why? Because the Green Deal says that you can't use a car, you can't use an aeroplane, you can't, you can't uh, see, uh, book a uh, what to say, you can't walk to Hawaii or from America, you can't walk in, walk to Asia. So there are issues that has to be uh, decided. As a result of growing societal and national resistance to these institutions has begun to emerge in uh, conjunction with transnational disputes. Now summary, international institutions help promote cooperation between states and thereby help alleviate the lack of trust between states and states fear of each other. Now what is the criticism? There is little room for trust among states. Each state must guarantee its own survival since no other actor will provide its security. Now who are the Republican liberalists? Now we are going to the last school that is Republican. Thomas Paine became notorious because of his plan, uh, pamphlets. In the age of reason, he advocated deism, promoting reason and free thought and argued against institutionalized religion in general and Christian doctrine in particular. It is built on the claim that liberal democracies are more peaceful and law-abiding than other political systems. Most of you know, it has come back in the 20th century as a democratic peace theory. Democracies do not fight each other, first articulated by Immanuel Kant and then by the American philosopher Thomas Paine. Now current thinking. Dean Babst was the, uh, uh, an American sociologist who first wrote an academic paper arguing that democracies do not fight among themselves. And Bruce Russett is the Dean Ancient Research Professor of International Relations and Political Science at Yale. He's, he's the other thinker who has been writing on this act. Now Bruce Russett, he said his communism's collapse merely the passing particularly of lethal advis advisable uh, relationship between the superpowers or an extraordinary chance to make fundamental changes in how nations resolve conflicts. The more democracies there are in the world, the fewer potential adversaries we and other democracies will have and, wi and the wider the zone of peace will be. The person for us in international relations is Michael Doyle. He is an international relations school who is the theorist of the liberal democratic peace theory and author, author of liberalism and world politics. He has also written on the comparative history of empires and evaluation of UN peacekeeping. He was born on uh, what to say, he is a uh, professor, he, how he thinks about world politics that there are important elements of liberal internationalism of which we must be aware. And these are nicely summarized in the article by Michael Doyle. Doyle generally is considered one of the leading liberals of IR scholarship. He developed the notion of democratic peace thesis and extension of the Kantian thought. What is a democratic peace theory? Democ Doyle based his argument on Immanuel Kant's classical treatment of the subject. He says there are three important elements. One, the existence of domestic political cultures based on peaceful conflict resolution. Democracies encourage peaceful international relations because democratic governments are controlled by their citizens who will not advocate or support wars with other democracies. Here to a certain extent I would also accept that political cultures matter. 
For example, please say, take it in all the British colonies in Asia and Africa, how many democracies are there? India is one of the oases of democracy. So we are not democratic because of the British ruled over us. The credit should rather go to the great Hindu civilization where the celebration of diversity is. This is extremely important. Show me which other culture accepts diversity. For them, it is only one path and one God. And if you don't accept even that narrow path, they are ready to cut off people's heads. So if you see clearly, we have to appreciate that we are a culture or a way of life or civilization that respects or celebrates cultural diversity. Democracies hold common moral values which lead to the formation of what Kant called a pacific union. The union is not a formal treaty, rather it is a zone of peace based on the common moral foundations of all democracies. Freedom of expression and key communication promote mutual understanding internationally and help to assure that political representatives act in accordance of their citizens' views. Three, peace between democracies is strengthened through economic cooperation and interdependence. The spirit of com commerce, mutual and special gain for those involved in international economic cooperation and exchange. So democratic peace, why don't liberal democracies fight one another? Combining Doyle and Kant, the answer is constitutional law and democratic self-interest. Democratic republican structures reinforce caution and high, about high costs of war. Two, international law and mutual respect for other states complements constitutional guarantee of caution helps engender future cooperation, so civilian control of government. States respect cosmopolitan law and spirit of commerce adds material incentives to moral commitments. So three conditions of peace among liberal democracies is democratic norms of peaceful resolution of conflict. Two, peaceful relations between democratic states based on a common moral foundation. Three, economic cooperation between democracies and ties of interdependence. And many of this they say that because especially the breakup of the former Soviet Union, they thought that a new wave of democratization came. We have earlier shown you of Samuel Huntington's uh, how there have been waves of democratization. After the end of the Cold War, led liberal optimism as regards the future of democracy. Two, fragility of the democratic process. All countries do not become democratic. Now take, for example, when they tried it out with Arab Spring or Arab Winter, it brought in most of what to say, uh, very fundamentalist right groups like uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And uh, minorities, they don't treat minorities equally. And most minorities, at least with a dictatorship, you may be second class citizens. But here they don't even accept them. Take Pakistan, they don't even accept Ahmadiyas and Shias, any Shia groups, Ismaili, Kojas, Bokharas, anybody as Muslims. They say they're not Muslims. So this is a made this whole fragility of a democratic progress. Democratic peace is a dynamic process rather than a fixed condition. Huntington on political order, I was just telling you that. Democratization process leads to higher civil warfare and higher involvement in external warfare. The combination of popular mobilization and uh, institutions, democratic in democratizing states, uh, tempts elites to play the nationalistic card. Partial democracy is more conflict prone. Intermediate regimes or anocracies lack the ability to resolve conflicts. Hence, there is political instability. 
Now, what is the neorealistic critic? Two groups. Weak liberals moved closer to neorealists and strong liberals support liberals. Human nature is complex. View of history, liberals are progressive. It is not possible of liberal states to transcend an argument. Weak liberals have retreated. Strong liberals claim that the world is changing in some fundamental ways which are in line with liberal expectations. World politics is changing dramatically from a state system to a transnational political system. Very doubtful, especially after 9-11 and this present China virus or what China plague or COVID, whatever you want to call it, after this major crisis of 2020. Existence of common interests of states. The counterattack of strong liberalism. Anarchy need not be wrong. Legitimate authority exists in international relations, two types of peace among heavily armed powers, among consolidated democracies. Liberalism and its wave, especially what you have, what is called structural liberalism as well. Guilford John Ickenbury is a theorist of international relations and one of the proponents of this idea. What is structural realism? Daniel Horace Duendi is an American political scientist. He published works mainly in the field of international relations and political theory with an emphasis on geopolitics and republicanism. Duende's book, Bounding Power, Republican Security Theory from the Polis to the Global Village, is a revolutionary in its field as he seeks to carry out a profound critique of realism and liberalism. He argues that realism and liberalism are both fragments of a broader tradition of Republican thought in contrast to either realism or liberalism. Republican political thought is focused on negotiating the space between anarchy and hierarchy. Very good idea. Duendi remain, uh, Duendini, uh, remains a liberal theorist describing liberalism as not the enemy of re Republican security theory, but its privileged child. He believes the liberal democratic model will prevail in the world and without believing the triumphalism of Francis Fukuyama, he paraphrases him, says liberal states should not assume that history has ended, but they can still be certain that it is on their side. Elements of a liberal world order. Security co-binding refers to the liberal practice of states locking one another into mutual, mutually uh, constructive institutions like NATO. Penetrated reciprocal hegemony is special in which the US leads the Western order. The US is an open, diverse political system and that is also receptive to pressures from partners. Semi-sovereign and partial great powers refer to the special status of Germany and Japan. They have imposed constraints on themselves as great powers. Economic openness in a world of advanced and industrial capitalism, the benefits of are so great that liberal states cooperate. See, when your costs are lower and your benefits are higher, they believe that anybody would cooperate. Civic identity expresses common Western support for the values of political and civil li civic liberties, market economies, and ethnic toleration. For example, now what President Macron is trying to fight against people who don't want and who don't understand the culture of dissent, who don't understand the basics of a secular democratic nationalism. Now, what are the liberal values? Freedom, responsibility, tolerance, social justice, and equality of opportunity. So we have finished with a very important school in international relations after realism we have finished off with liberalism and neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is a very dominant trend, especially in the present economic order or the international political economy. And also the school, after the breakup of the former Soviet Union, 
has re-emerged as a major uh, school in international relations. Thank you.